Okay, photograph anything in the scene that has any bearing whatsoever. Now, I've listed ones that are, in fact, I probably shouldn't even have made this list because it's so obvious. Bullets, uh, bullet holes, that's obvious. You would take pictures of that. Blood spatter, you take pictures of that. Any signs of a struggle, so you have overturned furniture, broken lamp, those are obvious. Fingerprints, indications of drugs or alcohol. Those ones I shouldn't even have listed for you but you, because you would have listed them anyway. But what I want to talk about are the things that aren't as obvious. A big part of any death investigation, which a lot of the crime scenes you're going to be involved in are death investigations, either homicide, self-inflicted, or uh, did I say homicide, self-inflicted? Yeah. Suicide, self-inflicted. <laughs> homicide, somebody else killed them. I confused myself. I got myself confused for a second. New category. Oh, yeah, new category. <laughs> so, you're going to be involved in death investigations. Now, I, uh, some of you are going to come on the tour of the medical examiner's office next week. I know some came when I went yesterday. So, in Maricopa County, we have a medical examiner. And their job is to determine two things. Cause and manner of death. So whenever we have a, a death, and, and I'm trying to remember the numbers that Mike gave me yesterday. There were 32,000 deaths in Maricopa County last year. By the way, Maricopa County is the fourth largest county in all of the United States. The only counties that are bigger than Maricopa County um, are Los Angeles, uh, Cook County, which is uh, Chicago, and I, I, the other one I think is in Texas. So Maricopa County is gargantuan, by the way. It goes everywhere from Wickenburg to Apache Junction, way down to Gila Bend. It is a gargantuan county. It's the size of the state of New Jersey. Yeah, it's huge. So, 32,000 deaths in Maricopa last year. 12,000 of those deaths were uh, questionable deaths, that meaning that there was some question as to why they happened. Uh, 8,000 of those deaths were referred to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office, and 6,000 of those they took jurisdiction on. Okay. Keep in mind, though, also, if you're going to be cremated in Maricopa County, the medical examiner's office has to give the okay for that. Um, because the, you can't just, because they have to make sure that there's not any question with the death and that the family just doesn't like yeah, sweep it under the rug. Under the rug. Exactly. Right. So if, if, if yeah. that's your medical, if that's your wishes, by the way, for, uh, for you once you die, the medical examiner's office has to actually sign off on that before they're allowed to do that. But let's say the 6,000 cases that they admitted. They did 45,000, 4,500 of those rather, came into the ME's office and had some sort of autopsy done. So then they had to determine cause and manner of death. Now in Maricopa County, there are five manners of death that are going to be reported on a death certificate. You guys think you can nail them? You should be able to. If you can't, make sure they're in your notes because this will show up on the final. Homicide. Homicide. Suicide. Suicide. Accidental. Accidental, natural causes, and undetermined. So again, those five, homicide, when one person kills another person. Suicide, when one person kills themselves. Natural causes, so something like the person had cancer, right? Does that go through the They can, depends. If it's, if it's suspected, if it's weird, like um, if it was under some unusual circumstances. If you have a 30-year-old who has a heart attack, uh, it, that's still natural causes, but it's unusual, so that will probably still do an autopsy. Fourth one na uh, is accidental. Someone, I don't know, they, they, they fall off a building and they die. <laughs> and then the fifth one is, they're not sure, undetermined. Right? Now, you guys, first of all, it's important to understand the difference between cause and manner. So remember, manner of death is homicide. What could be the cause of death? Remember, homicide is one person killing another. Cause is how they die. Stabbing, shooting. Yeah, stabbing, shooting, choking, those sorts of things, right? So they have to figure that out. Now, another big thing that the medical examiner's office helps with is determining time of death. Because time of death is a big factor in the investigation of the death, especially if we think that there is a crime that's been involved. Because if we know when the person died, that helps us to narrow down the list of suspects that could have killed that person. So time of death. Now, I want to talk about time of death in terms of some things that the medical examiner's office uh, will help with. But also, there are clues at the crime scene that can help us narrow down time of death, too. Let's talk first about the ones on the body. These are the ones that the medical examiner 
is going to be able to help you with. All right. So time of death. What are indicators that can be found on the body that the medical examiner can help us with? And by the way, these are things that in some cases we can photograph at the scene that can help us figure out time of death. What are those things? Okay. So, all right. So first of all, let's talk about stage of decomposition. And because those things come into, into play there. Stage of decomposition is a big indicator of how long the person's been dead. Now, in terms of decomposition, there are a few different stages that the body goes through. The first stage is called the fresh stage. And it typically it lasts from about the moment the person dies until about two days later. Fresh stage is about two days in length. So about 48, 48 to 72 hours in that period. After the fresh stage, the body begins to go through the next stage, which is bloat. This is when the, the, the body tissues are really now beginning to break down. They're producing gases, and so the body begins to, to bloat. Even you skinny folks will look fatter than me when your body starts to bloat up during that second stage. All right. After bloat, then the, the body will typically begin to skeletonize or mummify, depending upon the environmental condition. Right. The bloat stage, by the way, can last a very long time. Now, the length of these stages, by the way, does vary depending upon the environmental conditions. If it's really, really cold, right? If you if you die and your body is in Alaska somewhere, you're, you'll actually stay in the fresh stage for a very long time. Your, in fact, your body won't begin to bloat. It, it could it could be weeks for the body to start to bloat because. The bacteria that begin to eat your body away and produce those gases, they, they, they're not active when it's cold. That's why you, know, you take a steak, you put it in the freezer. That's why that steak stays good, because it's in the freezer. On the other hand, if you're in an environment that's really warm and moist, your body is in the jungle somewhere, you're going to start, it happens much quicker, right? All right. Also, your physical condition, how, how much muscle you have or how chubby you are like me, that actually affects it as well. You can hang out a lot. What's that? So you'll hang out a lot. That's right. All right, now, so a couple of you guys mentioned some of the things that happen during what we call the fresh stage. I heard albor mortis. I heard uh, skin discoloration, which is typically associated with liver mortis, and also rigor mortis. Let's talk about those three. Rigor mortis, R-I-G-O-R-M-O-R-T-I-S, rigor mortis. Liver mortis, sometimes pronounced liver mortis. Also, sometimes shortened to the word lividity. It's L I V O R M O R T I S. Also called lividity, L I V I D I T Y. Does that get your question, Kate? No, I need to just spell the first one again. Sure. Rigor mortis, R I G O R M O R T I S. Mortis, the last one is the same on all three. So we have rigor mortis. Think about rigid, because that's what rigor mortis is. Liver mortis, L-I-V-O-R-M-O-R-T-I-S. And then the last one is called alger mortis, A-L-G-O-R-M-O-R-T-I-S. Let's talk about what those are. And I'm going to show you some images of what they look like in a moment, too. Okay. So let's talk about liver mortis first, because that's one of the first ones that sets in. I think I heard Anna mention before one of the things that we can take a look at to determine time of death is the discoloration of the skin. And that's true. All right, so uh, when you're alive and you're moving, right, and your, your heart's pumping, and your heart, as it, as it beats, it pushes the blood throughout your body, right? Now, what I'd like everyone to do, please, I want you to take your, your finger. If you don't have painted nails, some of you have painted nails, it's not going to work. But if you have unpainted nails like I do, I want you to push on your nail, push on top of your nail, right? Your nail's probably pink. But notice that you push on top of the nail, it turns what? White. White. And that's because there are small little blood vessels underneath your nail that are full of red blood, which makes the skin pinkish in color. But then when you push on that, what that does is it pushes the blood out of those vessels. But then when you release it, it goes back to pink because the blood rushes back in, right? That's because you have a uh, you have circulation because you have blood pressure. Your heart is beating, which is pushing the blood throughout your body, right? Which is great, because if you didn't have circulation, you wouldn't be able to stay upright, 
because you wouldn't have any blood to your brain because all the blood would flow down to your feet, right? Your, your heart pushes the blood up to your brain so it gets the oxygen it needs to do its job, right? But when you're dead, heart's not beating anymore, which means there's no more blood pressure. Now, what happens to the blood when there's not the heart pushing it throughout the body? It just runs down towards the ground, right? If I was, if maybe, maybe if I was propped up against the wall, which it's not likely to happen, but if I was propped up against the wall and I was dead, where would all the blood flow? Down to my feet. What's more likely to happen is what we're going to have here with dead Bob, when they're on the ground, laying down, prone. Now, he's on his back right now. Where's all the blood going to settle? Down towards his back, exactly right. Towards the back. It actually won't settle on his butt because the pressure in his behind, because it's pressing against the floor, will keep the blood out of that area. Well, so all the blood flows downhill. And what happens then is it turns the skin in that area, typically turns it a reddish purple color. That settling of blood and that discoloration of skin is what we call liver mortis, or what we normally shorten to the term lividity. Lividity. Now, how long does it take for lividity to set in? Well, it'll start to, your skin will start to discolor after just a couple hours. Two or three hours, it'll start to take on that pinkish red color. Now, the question is, how long does it take for lividity to set? And let me tell you what I mean by set. So your blood, as it's in your body, is nice and liquid, right? Because remember, blood is primarily water. 70% of your body weight is water. And that's because the majority of your body weight is blood. So, and as the blood <coughs> settles, what ends up happening is the blood begins to clot up, coagulate, chunk up. And so what happens is it begins to kind of harden and set. Typically, lividity, the blood, as it settles, will set up in less than 12 hours. Right, so what does that mean? That's an important thing to determine how long a person's been dead. Because if we find a body, and the blood has settled, and it is set up, that tells us the person's been dead how long? At least 12 hours. It could be longer than that, but it does tell us at least at a minimum it's been 12 hours. Now, how do you tell if lividity's set up? Push the skin. You push the skin. Remember before how we pushed our fingernail and it went white? With lividity, if you push the skin, if the lividity is set, it will not go white. It'll stay that reddish purple color. However, if the lividity is not set and you push it, it will blanch. It'll go white. That means it's not set yet. So if the lividity is not set yet, we know what? Less they've been dead less than 12 hours. So that's a, you see how that's a good clue as to how long they've been dead? It, it, it turns, your, it's, it's, not as pre, it's not as present on your skin, but on your fingernails you'll see it. Okay. Now, the other thing lividity is very useful for is it can tell us if the body's been moved. Right? So let's imagine, we've got dead Bob here. Let's imagine I broke into dead Bob's house here, right? And I, and I, I came up behind dead Bob in the kitchen. I came up behind him, and I, I put a choke on him, right? I choke him to death, right? Passes out, keep choking, eventually he dies, right? And then I let Dick Bob fall, right? And he's dead. Okay. Now, so let's say, uh, let's say, um, maybe, uh, I, I, maybe I brought him now. So I go, and I go up in the bedroom, and I steal all the stuff in his room. I go through the, the jewelry box and steal the jewelry, and I, I break open the safe. I, I steal stuff. Maybe I come downstairs. I'm, I'm hungry now after doing all that work. I make myself a sandwich. Right? I know Dead Bob lives alone. I'm not worried about someone else coming home. I, I can take my time. So maybe after four or five hours, I'm done ransacking the house. Now, Dead Bob's been lying there the whole time. Five hours. What's happened to the blood during that time? It's started to settle. So that means if he's laying on his back, that blood is now settling in his back. And so that, that area of the back is starting to turn a pinkish red color. Has the lividity set yet, though? No. 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 Okay. So now, ha I want to make it look like Bob, I didn't murder Bob, I want to make it look like Bob killed himself. I want to make it look like he hung himself. So I, I take out a rope, and I throw a rope over a, you know, some, some hanging joist or something. I put it around Dead Bob's neck, and I hoist him up, right? I tie it off, and then I leave. Now, what's going to happen to that blood? 
What's going to happen to that libidity? It's now going to drain. If he's hanging from his neck, it's now going to drain down towards his feet because it hasn't set yet. So then by the time his body is discovered, the libidity will be down in his lower legs. And so the investigators might think, oh, maybe he did kill himself. Well, now let me give you, just a second, Del. Let me give you a different situation. Okay, so again, again, let's say I break into Dead Bob's home here. Again, let's choke him out again. All right, he dies. Uh, I, I panic and I leave. Maybe, maybe we got in an argument. I didn't mean to kill him, but I did. I leave, I go home. I, I go to bed, and, and I, I'm all, all night I'm fretting, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I killed him. I wake up the next day, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover this up. I'm going to make it look like he killed himself. So I go back the next day. It's been 12 hours. I come back. I think, I'm going to string him up. I'm going to tie a rope up, string him up, and I do that. But the problem is the body's been sitting there for 12 hours. So now what's happened? The libidity is self-set where? In his back. So when I string him up, it's, it's going to stay there. So as an investigator, if you see someone hanging and all the libidity is in their back, we have a problem. Because if they're hanging, it should not be there. Where should it be? It's going to be in a couple places, actually. It's going to be in their lower. Certainly most of it will drain towards their legs. But keep in mind, as your, as your arms, all the blood from your hands, is, your arms is going to drain down towards your hands. Typically, as you hang, all the blood from your head and face is going to drain towards your chin. You'll get lividity in the chin. And sometimes even, depending upon your ears, you get a little bit of lividity at the bottom of the earlobes. Lividity is a really big thing to take a look at. All right? But you can definitely see how it's valuable for determining time of death. All right, let's talk about rigor mortis. Right? So remember, I, I choked that Bob out, left him there. Rigor mortis, think about the word rigid, which means stiff. Right? We've all heard the the slang term for a dead body, we call dead body stiffs. The reason is because dead bodies do become stiff. Rigor mortis sets in. What happens is the muscles begin to crystallize and stiffen up. And so what happens is bodies become rigid, like a plank, like a board. How long does it take for rigor mortis to set in? A couple of hours. Within about three or four hours, the body will start to stiffen up. Typically around 12 hours, it will be completely stiff. When I brought students on a tour of the ME's office a few years ago, while we were there, they brought in a body of a woman who passed away. She had a heart attack in her bathtub. Oh. And uh, think about when you're in your bathtub. Most bathtubs are kind of short, and so hers was one of those shorter bathtubs. And so her arms, she'd been sitting in the bathtub, right? Think about in the short bathtubs, you got your knees kind of pulled up, you kind of got your elbows up. So she had died in the bathtub, and then her body had gone into rigor mortis, so she was locked in this position right here, right? So you could see it in the body bag that she was in a weird position. If they um, put her into a casket or whatever, I don't know what her place for or after death, but if they put her in a casket, would they move the arms? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, because here's the important thing about rigor mortis. It doesn't stay. Right. It goes away. So that stiffness that occurs at about 12 hours, after about 36 hours, it goes away, and the person goes back to being limp again. So putting them in a cast, it's no big deal because they've gone back to being limp again. All right? So that's a big deal. If the body is in full rigor, meaning they are fully stiff, again, we know that they've been dead at least 12 hours, but not 48 hours. So we're, again, we're talking about somewhere between 12 to 36 hours. Now we're starting to narrow down that time of death. Question you need to And there must, but there must have Stay crystallized even though they're limp? No, they start to loosen up again. Because again, the bacteria starts to do its job, starts to break the body down. Remember I said before your physical condition affects this? Yeah. If you're a major bodybuilder, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, rigor mortis sets in and it stays set in for some time. And it sets in a little faster too. Yes? Uh, okay, okay, no, that's a good question. So, like, for example, certain people have a physical condition where maybe their joints lock up, things like that. I don't know the answer to that question, Gabe. I really don't. Um, rig rigor, I think it, it, you could tell the difference between maybe a, a joint that's locked up versus the muscle. Because you can actually break rigor. It is sometimes necessary to, in order to get a body in a body bag. Because if you have an arm sticking straight up like this, you can't get the body bag shut. So they have to like almost, it, it, it almost will sound like they're breaking the bone. It's really just kind of, it's, what it's doing is it's just kind of breaking that muscle crystallization so they can get the arm down and get it in the bag. 
almost like regular ice. Which one? I, I guess that would probably be similar to that. Yes, question. <coughs> uh, I think you guys were told that three times back in Cody when Arwen has his hand up constantly and they have to duck in his arm back down. I remember Zach and Cody, but I do not remember that episode. My kids watch yeah, that. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay, at least somebody knows. All right, so, so that's rigor mortis. But you can see again by what stage of rigor they're in, gives you a time of death. All right, next one. Albert Mortis. Can anyone tell me what Albert Mortis is? <laughs> it's interior body temperature, right? All of us are warm blooded creatures, right? Our bodies, we metabolize calories, we burn calories, right? What, what is the equation for every one calorie it raises your body temperature by one degree Celsius? That's what a calorie is, right? I don't know about it's something like that. Ask the biologist that. So the thing the reason we eat food, right? is because our body burns the calories that are in that food to maintain our core body temperature and also to give us the energy we need to walk and talk and all that kind of stuff. But we, our bodies, because we're warm-blooded mammals, we maintain a core body temperature of 98.6 degrees, right? But when we die, we're no longer metabolizing calories, right? Our muscles are no longer burning those calories. So what happens to our body temperature? It drops. It begins to cool down. That cooling of the body temperature, we call that Albert Mortis. What it does is it, it'll begin to match room temperature, ambient temperature. So actually, when I say cools down, that's not always the case. Because if you died in a sauna, your body would actually heat up. It would actually match the ambient temperature. Now, most people, when they die inside a room like this, which is air conditioned, around 75 degrees, so that would cool down. But technically, the body could heat up. It just begins to match room temperature. There are uh, tables out there that would say that it would drop about one degree for every hour. But again, that varies. It depends on the type of condition. Is it refrigerated? Is it, if it's outside and we have the temperatures increasing or decreasing, fluctuating. So Albert Mortis can be used as a general rule of thumb, but you definitely wouldn't want to say for sure, okay, because this body is exactly 85 degrees, they've been exactly dead this many hours. It's a, all of these, by the way, are, they're, they're guesstimates. Um, one other one. I'll get your question in a second, though. Uh, stomach contents is another thing that the medical examiner's office can take a look at. If we know what your last... So, for example, if you show up dead, right? So let's say the cleaning lady comes to your house at 7 o'clock in the morning and finds you dead. But the night before, you went out to Olive Garden with your friends and family to have a nice meal. And, and we know for sure that you had spaghetti bolognese at 9 p.m. Well, guess what? When they do the autopsy, they can look at the contents of your stomach. And if the contents of the stomach still show that that spaghetti bolognese hasn't really been digested or not, they can say, okay, well, this person was only dead. They were killed within two hours of eating that meal. So we know that you ate the meal at 9 o'clock. You ate <coughs> sometime around 11. Which mortis comes first? There's not, a, there's not one. Uh, alphabetically, it would be Albert Mortis. But, yeah. they, they all start about the same time. Again, the lividity sets in about three hours. Rigor mortis starts to set in after about three hours. And the body begins to cool immediately. Touch your dead body. The person's been dead for about an hour, they're already starting to cool down. And then if they're outside like here, it's real hot, 120 degrees, the body temperature go up to match the environment. Yep. Yep. All right. So those are all the ones that the medical examiner's office will take a look at. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about the ones that are in the scene. What are the clues? inside the house that can tell us how long that person's been dead. Right. So let's take a quick break.